<sighs> I've got an apology to make here, guys. About the last editorial I made, I was wrong. Completely and utterly wrong, and for that, I'm really sorry. It's not an L2, it's an I2. Don't say it, I know, it was a stupid mistake to make, but to me, the I just looked like a lowercase L everywhere I looked, so, yeah. I hope you can understand why I made that mistake, but nevertheless, I'm happy to own up to it and say I'm sorry for making it. Phew, feels good to get that off my chest. Let's move on. What? Why aren't we rolling the titles? Oh, wait, hang on. You mean you were hoping that I would apologise for pointing out that one of the most overrated steam locomotive designs of all time were, in fact, not very good? Pfft, yeah, keep dreaming. This old broom has had 17 new heads and 14 new handles in its time. Can it be the same bloody broom? Then? Well, here's a picture of it. What more proof do you need? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the modern metaphor for any tangible object with interchangeable parts in history. It's an interesting debate, which is coming up more and more often in railway circles as machines, equipment and infrastructure are forever getting older and their historic value increases. And for the benefit of not getting lost in a spider's web of what's what, I'm going to centre my case-by-case -case analysis of this metaphor specifically around steam locomotives seeing as that's mostly what my job entails. But also because if anyone mentions one more thing to do with the prototype HST, I swear I'll go mad. At the core of this argument is the fact that, in the UK at least, every steam engine is only certified to work for 10 years at a time. Seven if we're talking mainline certification. After that, barring any boiler ticket extensions, the engine has to be overhauled by law. All components, moving or otherwise, have to be replaced at numerous intervals over several periods of time depending on how much the locomotive gets used, how hard it's worked, and how it's looked after. But eventually, there'll come a time when everything on the locomotive has been replaced and nothing quote-unquote original is left, even down to the frames which are considered the skeletal foundation of the machine. So what is there to actually preserve when that day comes? For example, the oldest steam locomotives in existence, such as Puffing Billy, Locomotion, the original Rocket, and Invicta, haven't run for well over a century and a half. In three out of those four cases, replica machines were made to celebrate major anniversaries and publicity events. But why was this decision taken for these particular machines instead of effectively rebuilding the originals? And how long will it be until such a thing happens with more modern machines? A similar debate has been held around Stepney for a while now, simply because the locomotive has been used so much since her last refurbishment in steam days that her last working stint on the Bluebell was only certified for five years of limited use instead of ten years of regular work. Literally, she was limited to pull about 35 tonnes on her own, absolute tops. Most of the time, she double-headed with a bigger engine that did all the work. And even then, the engine was withdrawn from traffic, having barely run for four out of those five years. It's debatable how much of the locomotive can be reused instead of building a replica, but it's probably fair to call that debate... divisive. But if it turns out that just a handful of small components can be reused, then why should it be so divisive? After all, effectively rebuilding locomotives has happened before in preservation. When the Talathlin Railway was reopened by volunteers in 1951, the two original Fletcher Jennings tank engines were cream-crackered. Number two Dolgoch was steamable, but only just. The boiler inspector only certified her, having tested the thickest parts of the boiler while the rest of it was allegedly below minimum thickness. Meanwhile, number one Talathlin had been laid up several years before with a cracked steam chest. Having been supplemented by two former Corris Railway locomotives, numbers 1 and 2 were completely rebuilt by Gibbons Engineering in 1958 and 1963, respectively. When they came back, they looked and performed like factory fresh machines, right down to having teething troubles during their first few years of operation. It turns out very few original components were incorporated into the rebuilt machines. In number 2's case, the rods, wheels, cylinders, one buffer and a handful of fittings were incorporated into the rebuilt locomotive. Concurrently, number one's frames were not the original ones by 1958. They'd been replaced during a previous rebuild at Bagnall Works in 1919. So it seems even in steam days, this sort of thing wasn't really declared blasphemous. And as it turns out, not just on smaller engines. The LNER A10s and A3s had frame cracking issues their whole lives. As such, it was common practice since the 1930s to have enough spare sections in stock to make up a whole set. Two sets worth since Great Northern was rebuilt, 
Even with other components such as boilers, valves, chimneys and cabs, little seemed to be original as far as the LNER was concerned. But financially and economically speaking, it may not always make sense to completely rebuild an engine once it's supposedly life expired. Particularly now we're in a landscape where one-off and batch manufacturing is more commonplace than mass. In 1979, the Festiniog Railway outshot a brand new double fairly for the first time in 93 years. Earl of Merioneth had a subjective appearance compared to her predecessors, but filled a void in the Festiniog's motive power demands. So when the decision came in early 2018 to retire the engine after 39 years' service, some people were naturally in grievance having become attached to it. The locomotive's boiler, cradle, chimney, smoke boxes and water tanks are said to be life expired, while frame sections are said to be cracked and the most usable parts are the power bogies. Basically, the railway seems to think that it's more economic to build a brand new double fairly instead of overhaul the existing one. Hence why the Earl's power bogies are now being used in the new fairly James Spooner. But by now, the Square has gained her own following and has built up a longer working career than Mallard. So despite the power bogies being reused in another engine, some avenues don't seem entirely closed off. There's some hoping the Square is perhaps not dead but sleepeth, but at the end of the day, it's up to the Festiniog to decide what happens to it. Though it's also worth pointing out that a similar trick was pulled with the single fairly Taliesin in 1999, having built her largely from scratch but incorporating the original reversing handle, despite the original engine being scrapped in 1924. Though it does lead to an interesting segue, how do you conserve a locomotive? The simple answer seems to be, just don't run it, keep it in a warm dry place and everything will be fine. Sounds easy enough, they're effectively museum pieces at the end of the day, but here's the counter argument. They were built to run not prop up the furniture, and the moment you run them is the moment they develop more wear and tear, particularly in the boilers, which develop enormous stresses every time they're heated up and cooled down at both ends of the steaming cycle. Maybe that's why Mallard only ran for two years back in the 80s, to conserve as much of what's left as possible, original or otherwise. But the argument for keeping a locomotive going could be enforced by another historic machine. Since Donald Campbell's Bluebird K7 took to the waters 51 years after it crashed at Coniston Lake in 1967, the head of the Bluebird Restoration Project, Bill Smith, has expressed reluctance to tuck it away in a museum, wrecked or rebuilt. The boat was recovered from her resting place in 2001 and was in remarkably good condition. The renovation did involve replacement of the instruments and using a jet engine that was an amalgamation of other jet engines, so not 100% original but pretty close. But in response to anybody who declares the boat should have been left as it was salvaged out of respect to Campbell, or even just left where it was at the bottom of the lake, the decision seems to have been taken out of respect to members of Campbell's family who don't want him to be remembered for what was basically the most infamous disaster in the history of record breaking. Bill Smith was quoted in a BBC interview in February 2019 saying, It's a living, breathing, educational piece of history. Now it's about letting as many people as possible see it, getting the thing out there to inspire. Lock it away, and interest will wane. It just will. And that's a fair point. A steam engine is an interesting thing to look at when it's standing still in a museum. But when there's a fire in its belly, and you can hear the sounds, smell the smells, and witness all the bits and pieces moving around, looking at it becomes a different experience. It's almost like looking at stuffed animals in a museum, and then seeing them alive in the wild. Two very different experiences of the same creature. And sometimes, the thinking behind those experiences seemed to come and go with the changing of generations and policies. In 2008, the sole surviving LNER V2 Green Arrow was withdrawn from service following the end of her previous boiler ticket, and the excuse to not overhaul the engine since has been that the monoblock cylinder casting it's carried for donkey's years has been declared too historically valuable to risk damaging any further. But in March 2019, the National Railway Museum, <coughs> I'm sorry, the Railway Museum, that's going to take some getting used to, made a statement about which locomotives were being discussed for overhaul from 2021. Green Arrow was on that list, and apparently one of the terms for its return to service is that it uses that dreaded cylinder block. Does this mean the monoblock isn't so important after all? Or is it possible to remove the existing block and put it on display in the museum to show how it works while Green Arrow gets a brand new one at a great expense which will probably require the construction of unique cylinder patterns before it can be cast? It can't be used on other surviving Gresley locomotives so that potentially puts the manufacturing cost up even further as it may not be used again for another 50 years. And before anybody moans about how much was spent on returning her bigger sibling to service so the NRM, um, the RM, 
So that just doesn't sound right. Can clearly justify spending less on something the enthusiast market seems to value a lot more? Said bigger sibling is still the most famous steam locomotive in the world and still attracts more people that don't care about trains unlike any other railway related artifact out there. Like it, lump it, or watch the idiots nearly get knocked down by it. Constantly. As good as she is, I'm not sure Green Arrow has quite the same generalised appeal somehow. Even if the idiots tend not to bother with her and make things much easier for all of us. In any case, it's a question that, given the idea of conserving whatever exists at present, may well catch up with all locomotives in time. The Isle of Wight Steam Railway has two terriers in regular use, one of which being the historic gold medal winning Paris International Exhibition engine. Although the boilers have been replaced on both engines, how long before the decision is made to use them less and less often so they can be conserved over the two Ivert tanks that are now running there? And how long before such a decision is made over the Iverts? Hell, now it's pretty much common knowledge that Lions shall never work again. I guess it's only a matter of time before the guys who built the Planet replica in 1992 prove as good as their statement in the press by building that replica of Lion, or Tiger, or Thunderbolt, whichever seems to be the most popular by demand. But there may be a moral issue with replica machines. Now this point's going to sound like a very impractical armchair thing to say, so please bear with me on this one. While they're entirely possible, maybe some people might feel that a replica machine won't have quite the same spirit as the original. The replicas of the two broad gauge locomotives, Iron Duke and Firefly, have minor changes under the skin to allow them to comply with modern safety standards. Firefly's firebox is an up-to-date bell pair instead of an old-fashioned haycock. Iron Duke has most of the skeletal underpinnings of an austerity saddle tank, which is very well known for its association with Victorian engineering, and both engines have been given steam brakes, which weren't invented when the original Locos had been built in the 1840s. So while compliant with today's standards, there isn't that sense of will it, won't it urgency to slow trains down that the early railway travellers faced. Some of them would literally fear for their lives when the driver hit the engine in reverse, as that's exactly what they had to do in those days. Tangents aside, my point being that some replicas might seem a bit soulless by comparison to their original counterparts. It's a bit like those Disney live-action remakes that have become such a big trend in recent years. In many ways, they're impressive technological achievements that have made generations of new people aware of existing properties and the history surrounding such properties. But they may not necessarily move as many people in the same way as the originals, because the originals have already accomplished what they set out to do and continue to inspire new generations in their own way in doing so, carrying a lot more history and emotional weight to them. Now, I realise these Disney remakes are primarily being made to make money and extend the copyright of each franchise, but the points regarding emotional movements and carrying historical weight still kind of stand. In many ways, a replica of Campbell's Bluebird K7 is the more respective option to provide people the benefit of that experience. But can you imagine how soulless a replica of Bluebird would be compared to the one that set all those records, crashed and then lay at the bottom of the lake for several decades? And the same thing can be said about building a replica of Mallard or simply bolting Mallard's nameplates to Bittern for a couple of months. It just won't be the same. Back in the day, the idea of conserving machinery wasn't such a big deal as all locomotives were just built to run and keep on running. But nowadays, it's a little different. There are stories attached to certain parts, such as the damaged bits of frame section on Lion's tender when she was rear-ended in the Tipfield Thunderbolt. So once those bits are replaced, there are fears of those stories being forgotten. It's not like scrapping your car once the gearbox blows up and just buying a new car. Because even some of the rarest new cars are built as disposable items intended to last a few years so people will get rid of them and buy the new improved models. Steam locomotives were built to endure for decades with hundreds of tons in tow day in day out. Many have endured for longer than they were intended for, and you can hardly throw them away these days because even when they're in bad nick or you don't like them very much, they're not disposable white goods. They're priceless. Like the great livery debate, discourse surrounding originality and whether or not it actually counts as preservation will outlive the immortal. There are cases to overhaul locomotives and keep them going until the end of time, and there are cases to retire others or keep them retired. There are some in higher demand than others, there are some which have been allegedly replaced a long time ago, and there's some which nobody really cares about and would rather just see running no matter what's actually left of them. But considering it was common practice in the old days not to conserve machinery for the sake of keeping it running, maybe we shouldn't worry quite so much in certain circumstances. Whatever the case, it's up to whoever owns the engine in question to make that decision. And if the worst comes to the absolute worst and people don't want to throw another fire in their priceless museum piece, at least new builds and replicas are still possible. They might not have the exact same spirit and history as the originals, but they're still possible. Probably easier and cheaper in some ways too.
As always, if you agree, disagree, have anything to add, or just have too much time on your hands and want to mention your favourites that weren't mentioned because there's only so many tangents I can go off on before somebody accuses me of missing the point, then feel free to leave your thoughts in the comments below. Or you know where to find me by now, and hopefully you know my preference. I'm Chris, and I'm here to gauge the issue.